Hello, and welcome to today's ACM Learning Webinar. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and serving the over 100,000 computing professionals and students who are ACM's members. My name is Ani Shia. I'm an associate professor in the mechanics. Mechanical Engineering and Mechanics Department at Drexel University. My work at the Scalable Autonomous Systems Lab focuses on distributed sensing and sampling strategies for many robot systems and geophysical flows. To learn more about my background, check out the bio widget on the left side of your screen. For those of you who may not be familiar with ACM or what it has to offer, ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom panel, you'll find a number of widgets and resources. If you are experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press the F5 key in Windows, Command R if you're on a Mac, or refresh your browser on a mobile device, or close and relaunch the presentation. To control volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. At the end of your R presentation, we will have time for questions. Please type your questions into the Q&A box at any time and click on the Submit button. This session is being recorded and will be archived you will receive an automatic email notification when it is available. And check learning.acm.org in a few days for updates. You can, use, you can also use the Facebook and Twitter widgets on the bottom panel to share the presentation link with your friends, as well as tweet comments and questions using the hashtag ACMLearning. We'll be watching for your tweets. Today's presentation is disasters Robots, Computing, and Informatics by Dr. Robin Murphy. So, Robin Murphy is the Raytheon Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at Texas A&M University. She directs the Center for Robot Assisted Search and Rescue and has over 150 publications on artificial intelligence, human-robot interaction, and robotics. And includes, uh, she also has the two books, Introduction to AI Robotics and Disaster Robotics. In fact, Disaster Robotics um, won the 2014 Pro's Honorable Mention for Engineering and Science Writing at the American Publishers Awards. An IEEE Fellow and a founder of Roboticists Without Borders, she has worked in disaster robotics research and deployment since 1995. Murphy has inserted ground, air, and marine robots at 19 disasters around the world, including the 9-11 World Trade Center disaster, Hurricane Katrina, and the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident. Her numerous professional awards include the Motihoro Kizoi Award, the AUVSI Foundation A1 OB Award, and the 2014 ACM Eugene L. Lawler Award for humanitarian contributions within computer science and informatics. She has been declared an innovator in AI by Time, an alpha geek by Wired Magazine, one of the most influential women in technology by Fast Company, and one of the top 25 doers, dreamers, and drivers for 2015 by Government Technology Magazine. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce and welcome Dr. Robin Murphy. Robin, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Annie. And in the official greeting of Texas A&M, howdy. And I'm going to talk to you about disaster robotics. And while disasters present many computing challenges for robots, the bigger point is that disaster robotics isn't really about making better robots. It's about the data, getting the right data to the right persons in the right format in time for them to make effective decisions to save lives and to accelerate economic recovery. All right, I'm moving to the next slide. Okay, so in the talk, I'll briefly just say a little bit about Texas A&M and try to establish what I'll call street credibility, but really go into the phases of a disaster, 
uh, and some of the things I wish I knew when I first started working this area in 1995, and then go through what the challenges are for intelligent robotics, and then that I did this larger issue of computing and emergency informatics in general, and then conclude. So just a little about us here at Texas A&M. We're, of course, a top 10 engineering school. But what's really fascinating to me about Texas A&M is that we are a world leader in disaster uh, and emergency management. We have uh, the Texas A&M Engineering Extension Service trains over 280,000 emergency professionals each year and includes all the 28 USAR teams. We have facilities, disaster cities, 100 acres of all types of collapses and, and urban disasters, and I call it my favorite place on earth. And on top of that, we have 50, over 50 faculty in three colleges and nine departments that are working on what we call emergency informatics, which is about getting the, getting the data to the right people at the right time. And that search, is, as Annie pointed out, we, I run the Center for uh, Robot Assisted Search and Rescue, which has been established since 2001, before 9-11. And that's, that's our big mission. And it's very unusual in that we do our research based on field work and then use that to identify research issues that we go back and take back to the lab. And Roboticists Without Borders, uh, another one I encourage you to look at that on the web great group of people who work and donate their time before disaster so that they can be ready when we're invited. And of course my book and a lot of my talk uh, material today for my presentation comes from my book. It's based on my experiences up until 18, for 18 deployments plus my analysis of every disaster robot I've been able to verify through April 2013. Now one thing about the book is people look at that disaster robotics. I was at South by Southwest last year doing a book signing and a person said, oh yes, robots have been disasters, aren't they? And now they're weaponizing them. I mean, just robots, I can hardly wait to read all the ways that they've screwed up. And it's like, uh, no, robots can help. Uh, this. And he was very disappointed. He was looking for something else. So just to be clear, this, and what I'm talking about today, is how robots can help with disasters, not make them worse. Well, that is a possibility, as we'll see. So what are disaster robots? Well, let's start out, probably the easiest way to do that is to just give you a quick video clip of robots that we've used in the past. And it looks like we have a little bit of video clipping here, but anyway. Uh, the first use anywhere in the world were ground robots, and that was at the World Trade Center, taking advantage of this push for small mechanisms that was coming out of DARPA and out of NASA for multiple Mars rovers. And you see they're all very shoebox size, small. Uh, now you're seeing in 2005 UAVs, both fixed wing and uh, rotorcraft, were being used. 2005, you also saw the first use of surface, marine surface vehicles. Mine disasters tend to be the most commonly uh, common consumer of, of robots for disasters. Building collapses, fortunately, are less, uh, less frequent. That's a caterpillar-like robot, not a snake. There, there are differences. Again, back to hurricanes. Now you're beginning to see how you can pull the data together. Quadcopters, you know, we saw that whole set of advances and now we've Image got them everywhere now. Of course, Fukushima, uh, we were involved in assisting with uh, UAV flights, working through the, uh, the damage there. We came twice to the tsunami, working with Sohoko University and the great group there. Current autonomous underwater vehicles looking at reopening the port, and then there's always a surprise. They ask us to look and try to help them uh, recover victims. As so many people have been washed into the not breathing at that. That was actually a glove, but it shows you the types of things we see. You know, and also that shows why you want to sense and act. Being able to touch that made us realize it was a glove, it just torn. Uh, recently, we were at the Washington mudslides in Washington State, and so you see these very high, these very low resolution viewfinder images, but the high resolution photographs you can put together in these amazing photogrammetric reconstructions. Uh, most recently, we flew for the Texas floods, 
uh, applying some of the things we learned from the hydrologist. And again, you're seeing those types of uh, types of images that you see as you follow the river, trying to look at that complex terrain, looking for missing persons, any sign. And there were 20, 21 people that were missing that had been swept swept downrange. And some of the fun things that you can do now that you can do reconstruction is, is things like this uh, virtual reality reconstruction that Russ Taylor out of uh, North Carolina did for us. So it gives you an idea of what the robots look like and what they can do. Just just a quick overview. And you, you probably noticed that all of them were small. Even the water-based ones were one that two people could have just literally thrown in the water. And we call that man-packable if you can put it in a backpack or man-portable if two people can carry it. And the, the big thing is, is that if a person or a dog could have done the task, they probably would have. That's why having super small robots for building collapses are really important. Because if there was a way to do it, they would have already done it. Okay, And if it requires any kind of a trailer, or a boat ramp, a landing zone, there isn't going to be one. It's either going to, you're going to get in with an SUV and then you're going to have to carry it the rest of the way. And at World Trade Center, building collapses, you may be having to carry it down a straight ladder. You may have to be carrying it over lots of rubble to get, get it where it needs to be. So we're looking at small vehicles, uh, and that's been the history. So let's go over some definitions. I mean, we are scientists, right? So I prefer to use the term disaster robotics to rescue robotics because rescue often gets used somewhat incorrectly to the large set of missions that are in the what are called the rescue and re recovery phases. And rescue phase usually has legal, uh, the agency of legal authority to go on private property, yada, 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 whereas recovery, it's, it's not. And, and so there's the, the terminology gets used by the disaster professionals differently. Another thing is I'm going to call disaster robots things that are tactical organic assets that are directed by immediate decision makers, not the big, you know, predators or global hawks or things that are really expensive. And so you have somebody over here controlling it. And eventually the information trickles down to the boots on the ground people, the tactical decision makers. Okay. And that's because Mitigation response, we, all of those are usually done by civilian authorities and engineering expertise. And so we want to get them the information immediately. And even though it, it should be trickling down, it's usually very slow to get that. And another thing I would like to emphasize is that robotics for disasters is still formative versus normative. We're not replacing people or dogs or manned aircraft. We're often doing things that they can't do now. And so there's a lot. It's not normative. It's formative. It's up for our imagination, which is very exciting. And one example of that is is medical disasters. We just recently had a big workshop on Ebola and infectious diseases. And it turns out the ways you can use robots, everybody, oh, we'll replace, you know, we won't have to send nurses in and stuff. It's like, shoot, if we can just get the hall waste out. That would be a big win. So exciting times. I encourage you to be involved. Robots have been used. Uh, they're already being used a lot. They've been used that I've been able to document 47 disasters in 15 countries. You know, there's a, a little heads up to the United States uh, in that we're, we were early adopters, early creators. But you can see it's really spreading. And you can see as well by this, uh, the UGVs and the UAVs, unmanned ground vehicles, unmanned aerial vehicles, are getting a lot of use, right? So it's kind of tied on the frequency of use. But I would really like to just put uh, this idea out there that unmanned marine vehicles, those water-based vehicles, are important because 80% of the population lives by water. And that means our critical infrastructure is underwater, our levees, our seawalls, our ports, the way we get fed through, through shipping, that's all by water. So I see a big chunk of the future in disaster robotics being in, in unmanned marine vehicles. Let me just go through uh, the phases of disaster because we've gone over what robots look like and where they've been used. I want to talk about when they're being used and then that'll set the stage for when I go over how they've been used for specific missions. So you can think of the types of disasters, natural disasters and man-made disasters. And I know that mining, mineral, or, you know, like uh, energy-related disasters, Bhopal, those are, those are accidents. But it turns out that 
mining mineral energy related disasters are a little different than a building collapse, even though they're both accidents, in the sense that the authority for responding to the disaster belongs to the company that owns that resource. So natural disasters like your earthquakes, your geological disasters, your hurricanes, like your meteorological, those will go to the to the authority, the civilian authority. Same thing with man-made disasters that are like uh, bridge collapses or building collapses, that will go to that. But it's just, just uh, something to know and think about that as you, fun fact, it, it changes up some of the economics of response. Okay, waiting for that. What is interesting, the latest world report just came out. I haven't had time to integrate it, but it basically says the same thing. You're seeing 700, about 700 disasters a year, which hasn't actually changed over the last 20 years, but the impact is increasing because of urbanization. We're all flocking to urbanization, and in uh, a lot of countries, poor people on the outside, the infrastructure has not kept up. So these people were... The, the supply, the, the way people live was barely keeping up at what we'd call civilized, you know, just right at the edge, and now we've got a disaster. So we've got huge populations at risk. Look how many people get killed, over a million people each year, and a lot of it's from flooding, where you get 20 people here, 30 people there, two people there, over a wide area, and it begins to add up. And it's not just the people killed, it's the people who get displaced, and so not only are they displaced, but usually there are health consequences, they've been injured, they don't get a proper rehabilitation or medicine, so, so things they get caught and then it just stays with them forever. So you're almost talking about $1 trillion each year is being lost. So anything we can do to help that is a big deal, and that's one of the reasons why I'm in, it, in robotics. So what's the difference between an incident or a disaster? So an incident is actually a routine emergency, you know, like going and getting an ambulance and going to the emergency room is, is not the same as having a zombie apocalypse, right? And so incidents are things that are normally handled within the scope of the agencies or agencies normal operating procedures. A disaster is one when you have to seize local resources and you start having to ask your state or the state next to you for help, which they have ways of doing it and how it scales up. And so in the United States you're seeing, you know, just that that huge amount of thing impact. Phases of a disaster. Okay. So those of you who are social scientists or work in emergency net, it's like this is like a war search test because they change these phases like every 10 years and everybody argues about them. But we're going to just sort of use this and in, imprecisely. In so there's a disaster can be thought of the stuff that happens before those activities for prevention and preparedness. And then you have stuff that happens right after the disaster, which can be called the mitigation phase, the immediate response, the immediate recovery and reconstruction phase. Okay, stuff that you're trying to do to, to get everything under control. And then you have the longer term relief efforts, which are more focused on individual citizens and smaller groups, and that can go for decades, uh, as well as, as formal recovery. But that's often called humanitarian relief. Okay. So we have focused, my work, and I think the, and have encouraged the safety, security, and rescue robotics uh, communities, is to focus on that initial aspect of mitigation, immediate response, and immediate restoration of services. Because that's about the two, first two weeks to a month of a disaster. And so this is the part where the urban search and rescue teams are trying to find people in distress and save them. Uh, the Department of Transportation is trying to check out bridges, the structural engineers, are inspecting government buildings and schools for reopening. And most of the decisions here require some form of expertise that's not found in the general population. Either it's an engineering type of decision or regulatory decision, and besides, most citizens will be evacuated. So it's a very agency and centric phase. And what's fascinating to me is that there's a rule of thumb that was developed back in 1987 by Hans, Bowen, and Kate. That if you can save one day off of this phase, you can save a thousand days or three years off the total economic recovery time. Now, you can further break that down into, I, I would break that down into three categories of events, all of which I could go on for about an hour, which, you know, I'm sure you'd like for me to get, 
get back to the robot. Sorry. So anyway, there are three different strategies for using robots. So there's one that's going to be urban, which are localized to a small area or set of buildings. That's the World Trade Center. That's a building collapse. That's also a mine collapse. All right. Then you've got wide area. That's when you're trying to deal with a hurricane or tsunami or earthquake. And the third one is is the medical, where you're looking at infectious diseases. And that medical is actually part of urban and that, but the difference is infectious diseases are handled differently than mass casualty events. You know, a lot of people being taken out by an earthquake. Okay, so just to wrap up this idea of disaster phases and robots. Huge surprise. No FEMA urban search and rescue team owns a robot. Okay, uh, there's a lot of funding and standardization issues. Robots have been primarily designed and promoted for that initial response phase, which ignores the, that they could be used for prevention and preparedness. It'd be great to have these same robots inspecting critical infrastructure, and then you just kind of use them for these other things. And also how to integrate them with humanitarian relief phases. So I was just at a UN conference workshop, and there is more interest in that. And another sad thing is that they generally arrive too late to be effective because agencies don't own them and they're relying on groups such as Roboticists Without Borders. They're showing up about an average of 6.5 days after the disaster, and the first three days is really the critical part. So they're they're not always effective because of that. They they're useful, but not as effective as I think they could be. And so the big big thing here is to uh, I think the big win is to to think about how data that you could get from say the USAR teams flying a UAV to see the overall state. Can you share that with insurance companies so they can go ahead and start estimating the impact and share it with the American Red Cross, which are things that we are exploring here in the state of Texas. All right, so what does this mean for robotics? So, so for computer sciences, all of this is interesting, uh, and there's a lot of policy issues and stuff, and ACM has been wonderful at leading the forefront with that, but let's get to the technical challenges. For robots, the technical challenges come because you're asking the robots to do a huge set of different tasks. One is to search for survivors or, or search, you know, like track down a plume a spill. You're asking them to do reconnaissance and mapping. Sometimes search, you don't need to really see what's in, map the world. Uh, remove rubble. Uh, structural inspection and structural forensics is a big deal. The ones in boldface are where they've actually been used. And victim recovery. Uh, Estimating debris volume and the types of debris, which is really critical in, in getting a, a community back on its feet. Direct intervention, you know, turning a valve or, or a, a, a inserting a sensor to figure out what's going on. So, and you notice that there's no line of, that says searched and saved people's lives. Most of these aren't that kind of mission. They're, these are missions that help the responders kind of the same way fire trucks don't save lives and radios don't save lives, but we're pretty clear they, they actually make fire rescue go, go better. So think of robots that way. So when you ask me how many lives have they saved, and it's like we on, on these on a, a major disaster, uh, none, but they wouldn't be used that way. All right, so the first big technical challenge. There are going to be three big technical challenges I'm going to go through. The first big one is they have to operate under extreme conditions. I mean, this is like working on Mars, but you're working on Mars, and it's like an Apollo 13 event going down. First off, the terrain is actually harder than Mars because burrowing into rock has a high degree of verticality. You're actually kind of trying to repel down, and your your terrain is much less understood. So the extreme terrain and operating conditions is a big deal. All right. The next thing is is, is GPS and wireless denied environments. If you're flying near a building or a bridge, or you're you're doing a, uh, a surface vehicle, a water surface vehicle like we did at uh, Hurricane Ike to check the roller pass bridge, you can't, you'll be amazed at how much GPS is blocked or multipath. You go inside a building, you go inside rubble, you've lost wireless and GPS. So those are big challenges. And then the other, the extreme human robot interaction. So not only are you working remotely through a robot, which is sort of like working with a slight fever, there's a cognitive load, you're also at a disaster. You probably haven't had a lot of sleep. And there's just having been there. It is hard not to have a little bit of 
oh my gosh, this is a terrible event going on. All of those add both a cognitive and physiological load. So extreme conditions, both for the platform and for the operator. Second challenge, control style. How are you going to control that? And that really impacts where you add artificial intelligence, what, what autonomous capabilities are useful. So there are two styles to use. One remote presence, which is sort of teleoperation. I kind of hate that word. Okay, you use this a lot for inspection tasks, for situation awareness, where you're doing a Vulcan mind meld with the robot so that you can look and act through that robot in real time. And unlike in Star Trek, you almost always are doing it with another person. So if you're taking over their kind of their body, at least it's your body. But in our case, uh, you know, who's been a hummingbird, right? How do you relate to being a hummingbird or a dolphin? The other side is a uh, taskable agent, and I think that's what most people think of, and we're seeing most of the uh, most of the use of robots is actually in the remote present side because they want to look in real time. But taskable agent, you get that for surveys, things like that, and you, you're pre-programming the robot and you're hoping it comes back. USAR people tend to hate taskable agents because it may not come back, and if you don't have a, a wireless feedback with your sensor stream, which is usually high resolution imagery, which your bandwidth don't support, you're usually just recording on the platform, you don't get any data unless it comes back. So if you're in a mine and that robot goes off, you have to hope it's coming back because otherwise you've lost nothing. Whereas you'd much rather go with a tethered robot where you can go further and be assured to at least see as far as that tether goes rather than this all or nothing. And very interesting to see the style. Now, with aerial vehicles, we see a lot of them optimized for taskable agents so they can get really great photogrammetrics uh, take, you know, accurate snap, 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 snap of photos that you couldn't do manually. But every time we fly a vehicle in that style, a responder comes over and says, look, I need you to stop what you're doing and look over there. Can I look over there right now? And so you want to make sure you actually supply both. And we see the same thing with ground robots. The third challenge is reliability because, in fact, robots can make a disaster worse. At the Pike River mine in New Zealand, that, that mine collapsed, they sent in robots that were bomb squad robots that were supposed to be waterproof and kind of weren't. So a mine has a lot of water kind of dripping on the top, particularly when you've lost all of your equipment that's going to pump all that out. And so mines aren't really built to be bigger than it takes you to get to move through because you know, it takes a lot of energy to, to build extra corridors. So this robot basically died in place and it's blocking the, the only way in and out of that mine. Now, fortunately, they were able to recycle and restart and got it to move out of the way, but that's not a good thing. And so if you look at this, this taxonomy, you're thinking of, you know, is your failure, does it, you know, does it just kind of screw things up or is it a terminal failure? Is it, is it a failure like an external failure, like, it exploded, it was a methane environment exploded, so that's not really the robot's fault. Did the robot physically fail or was it human error? So what do you think? What do you think is the most frequent, frequent problem? The most frequent problem for, for terminal mission failures was slightly over 50% were human error. And it kind of makes sense when you think about it, right? Is that uh, in, if you're doing remote presence, it's very fatiguing. Uh, there's some nice work being done at the Na uh, Naval Postgraduate School in this. Our heuristic is is about 20 minutes of running a robot, regardless of whether it lands here or air, is about two hours of real time. You know, it just it just 20 minutes just seems forever. You're just so tired after that. And so it's very easy when you're tired to make mistakes, keep up, you know, run over your tether, bump into other robots, which we saw happen at the BP oil spill with the ROVs. And then we're going to see uh, the taskable agent has a problem, something called the human out of the loop control problem that even if you're supervising the robot, you can't always figure out what's going on fast enough. So 51% are, are listed as human error. Well, except I believe that the human that made the error wasn't the operator. It's usually because of such a bad user interface or just a not well thought out design of that human element that's really the human error was on the human designer part. Okay, so let me give you an example of that human out of the loop control problem, which they have known about since the 70s. And so whenever you have a, a machine system that a person's sort of supervising, uh, how long does it take them to fix that problem? 
And it turns out they don't always do that seamlessly, particularly for UAVs when they're flying at uh, very low So let's see this. I this is from a workshop oh, yeah, with GPS, uh, so are you ready? did uh, in uh, Wichita. He's yeah. like 3,000 hours flying this UAV. It's a standard one. You, you fly it at oversight. Then it's going to take right off on. and do this pre-programmed okay. pre mission. And only over. one person has to look okay. and you just fly it oversight. And that's me running the camera. I'm looking at it. A nice camera. We're, we're doing a, a, a picture for it. And why is it going that way? And then it's like, uh, no, that found. That's not good. What's going on? And you're seeing the pilot is, is keeping his eyes on the turning table to see what's going on. The other pilot, the pilot, is trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And they are just barely able to get the robot to figure out what's going on and get that landed. And in fact, I think a, uh, a less skilled pilot would have on that first bounce would have would have lost the platform and imagine if that had happened with that in line of sight and what had happened was the gps glitch had occurred with multipath right at the moment that it changed from takeoff and landing to pre-programmed route route planning so he had basically about eight seconds to, to figure out what the problem was. And then there was a, a confound on the, the ergonomics of the Futaba doesn't let you, you can't always tell if you've swapped modes. So those are the kind of things that continue to happen. And that causes these reliability issues and people not to really trust robots because we have that. So to go back over, uh, the three of the, the big challenges have to do with uh, really human machine systems that people have to use and, and, and trust. You know, extreme events are one thing, but how you match the control style with the mission that they're trying to do for the context they're trying to work in, their need to have reliable systems and trying to prevent unsafe preconditions from human factors. And that's led me to believe the majority of my work is actually in human-robot interaction, trying to get rid of that 50-51% that error rate. Some other challenges. By the way, I do field work. I have the National Science Foundation. I have a nice grant. I have this nice mobile lab. Not only do I have to deal with like diesel fuel and, and there's all sorts of additives you're supposed to do, but every now and then, you know, there's a dead possum under our, our trailer. What are we going to do about it? Is it dead? How do you even make sure a possum is not pulling a possum and dead? So we have crazy stuff. So field work is, is rife with surprises. Let me move over now to what I see as the real issue, emergency informatics. How what robots do inform and enable these decision makers to make the decisions that are going to save our lives and save our economy, make our lives better. And the first thing to keep in mind that really as a computer scientist, I think of this as a many to one problem in informatics. Any disaster is going to have about 25 agencies involved. And they're not guaranteed to be working. They're loosely coupled. They're not guaranteed to be working the strict military hierarchy. There is an instant command. But the deal is, let's take the Texas floods. That was three regions of Texas over Memorial Day. Just one of the regions spanned four counties. So you had four counties with two towns in them, each of those kept incident command for their jurisdiction. So the, 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 four, the six incident commands are trying to coordinate each of these 25 agencies and with each other's. So that's an interesting challenge. Also, it's a disaster. You try to have as few people as possible in the hot zone, and they're trying to get information and do things before and on behalf of the larger number of experts who are over in that cold zone in the emergency operations center. So keep that in mind. We've got this whole mapping of trying to get uh, robots just don't typically serve one person. They can serve lots of people. So we say it's the data. It's getting the right data or the right action from the right persons in the right format. And by format, I mean visualization. If you go off the, the standard, it's data until it's presented in a, in a way for a particular context, it's information, and then you add knowledge to the information, and that person then makes a decision. So that's where we're going with that. So let's just talk about some things. So getting information in time is not trivial. Okay, uh, here's an uh, thing, an exercise we had disaster say we had a chemical train derailment flew a UAV. So the UAV is over there uh, a kilometer away from the accident, which is a, a realistic standoff distance, which is only another kilometer away from the upper uh, arrow, which is where the instant commander is, is our emergency operations training center. The, we ran the exercise four times. 
it took an average of 20 minutes from when the UAV team with the hazmat specialist came. I'm telling you what I'm seeing, but I want you to see this set of four images because that will explain it so much better. It took 28 minutes to get it there. Uh, eventually, we just learned to stop what we we're doing and drive over there in four file transforms to take what would be a typical military platform, one of the most commonly used one, an air robot, Air 100 at that time, and get it to there into a format that they could get as, as a civilian response agency. So that was a, oh, that's not good. And it wasn't, you know, some of that was connectivity. There was, there were some interesting things of using the different networks, but connectivity really isn't a problem anymore. So, uh, in that case, it was the incident commander also once it got there, it was 28 minutes before it got there, they didn't notice the, the data had even had arrived, the incident commander did. But anyway, let's go back to our most recent Summer Institute where we replayed the Texas floods. We had 12 agencies, including Texas Task Force One, Hayes County, all these people, in, and they all said, nope, connectivity wasn't the big problem. It was the amount of data we had to deal with. So here's an example. Hayes County, they lost their landline, but within six hours, the Civil Air Patrol was flying a repeater node, and they are bringing in all those cells on wheels and stuff. And it's only going to get better, at least in the United States, because we're putting over, you know, billions into a first net dedicated public safety cellular system. So we may have problems with bandwidth, but connectivity is not going to be a huge deal breaker in the future, and it isn't now anymore. What was really uh, more challenging was it becomes getting the subset of information and packaging it or visualizing it in a way that doesn't overwhelm them uh, with a big deluge of, of, uh, of problems. And so one of the big things that we're seeing now is a move toward using photogrammetrics. And this can be really helpful for structural inspection, uh, doing debris estimation, uh, general situation assessment, uh, hydrology. And so this is a view of Disaster City. You're seeing uh, a rubble pile. Number one, you're seeing part of our Amtrak train. Just gives you a sense there's, there's lots more props out there. You can see why Disaster City is my favorite place on Earth, right? Okay, so that gives you an idea of, of what we're doing. And so the, the UAV had just flown a set of, of a pre-programmed flight so it could get chunk -a -chunk -a -chunk -a -chunk, snap, 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 high-resolution imagery. Now. What's really cool is with just the free ICE program from Microsoft, you can pull together an ortho mosaic of the whole area in five minutes. Look at that. 15 minutes of flight time, you've got five minutes later on a laptop, look what you've got, a nice thing. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't this great? Well, yeah, it's looking good, right? Look how, look at the resolution and you just zoom in on that. That's great. Except for the part if you're a structural engineer. Now you begin to wonder because look, we didn't, it didn't reconstruct the train correctly. The train has now got a little jog in it. And so that misalignment. And then if you go to another program, let's do, let's take the same data set, run it through a commercially available system, Agisoft. We ran it through their Agisoft photo scan. Interesting, you're seeing a little fuzzy on the edges, but that's okay, we're really only interested in the middle. Now we're gonna go back and look at it. Oh great, if I'm a, a civil engineer, I wanna be very sure about what are straight lines. And now I've got ghosting. I'm seeing artifacts that aren't there because it's not putting together the images exactly right. So what can look good at a very high level uh, may not be sufficient for the confidence for the type of decision an information consumer such as a structural specialist is using for. So that's a big deal for us. And when you think about that, so that's, an, that's one aspect. You've got to make sure your, your image processing and presentation is reliable and for what, tuned for what they want. Now here's another aspect to this. This gets back to this idea of the data avalanche. Well, uh, the floods, the big thing with the floods, it was a missing person search because we had uh, between 42 and then it quickly went down to 21 people missing. So now you've got to fly over about five miles of a river looking for any sign of mud, of debris or people. They're, they, if they're people, they're going to be covered in mud. You're looking for any color, shape, anything weird. And this is the kind of image you get. And it turns out and this is, uh, that you'll get about 800 of these images from what we flew, about two gigabytes of data. There is actually some debris in that image, so you really have to zoom in and look at it. So if you're looking at 
going to take maybe, if it takes you a minute per image, you're looking at a person, uh, assuming they could stay awake, do about 13, it takes 13 hours to go through just one 20 minute flight of data to look to see if there's anything there. And if you divide it up, then you've got, well, are you better at this than I am? Should I really have three or four people look at the same image to do it? So that really, What's exciting is that now brings in the idea of post-processing using computer vision and computing to really just scope down and do triage. And here's some fantastic work that's being done by our partners at Maryland and the University of California, Berkeley, that they quickly grabbed the data sets. And while some of our students were doing just look for color, things like that, look for odd shapes, they sit down and did some machine learning to look at debris that would be the size of where a person might be big enough to do that to look at and highlight those areas to help triage those images. And so we're really looking at that's really the future of robotics. Not, not to keep these things from falling out of the sky or to crawl into rubble, but to process the data for us and help triage it. So, uh, in emergency informatics, I think the big note here, the take homes are operators running robots aren't usually going to be the only information consumers. It may be a hazmat person staying with that robot operator with chemical spill, but there are decision makers, I guess, sort of behind them that need this too. Broadcasting all the all the data to everybody is not going to be practical. Even though we've got connectivity, we don't have bandwidth, and you can't deal, you can't sort through 800 images. So having reliable uh correct post-processing is going to be essential. And of course, that means really getting in there and understanding what each of the stakeholders or categories of decision makers are looking for so that we can design the algorithms to do that. So I'm gonna wrap up so that you know I could literally talk for hours because I know there's lots of questions and I wanna make sure that I'm available for that. So just to conclude, if you walked away knowing that that they're, they've been used in 45, disasters in 15 countries. Robots are around. They are being used. Uh, they assist. They don't replace experts. Think of them as the ground and aerial systems. I think of them as the king and the queen of the prom, but I think marine vehicles are maybe the most valuable in the long run, given, given the way the population is. The big barrier, and there are many other barriers, but the biggest one to me based on what I'm seeing is that human-robot interaction how to use the robots reliably, and what information should the robots and the computers provide. And then what's the information? The information, not the data, it's processing it that's going to provide the value proposition. So we continue to learn. We love to collaborate. I've worked with over 40 universities in our field exercises and such, and in industry, of course, through our robotics without borders. So we, we continue to, to try to learn from everyone and try to help promote the field. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to questions and answers. Great. Thank you so much, Robin, for such a great talk. And we have time for questions. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So the first question uh, that we have is if you can give us sort of your sense of what resources are most critical and in demand in the midst of a disaster that you think ACM members can contribute. Wow, what a great question. Well, I'm not going to try to dodge the question. It may sound that way. The biggest thing ACM can do during a disaster was to have been organized before disaster because there's all sorts of great computer vision algorithms. There's all sorts of uh, social apps, things that could be done but they're really hard to develop in real time and have in place fast enough to make a difference. And they require knowing disaster stuff, so working with the responders. So the biggest thing I can say to the community is, come on, let's, let's work with these different agencies and see what they really need so we're ready to help. We already have the procedures in place, so if you want to crowdsource something, they're already trained on how to do that and, they, you know, and that they can do it with the privacy restrictions and the accountability, all that, get that lined up in advance. Because during disaster, it's, it's catch up and usually the response agencies cannot absorb anything new. Great. So then um, our next question 
Um, it has to do, I think, with the second part uh, of the talk on disaster informatics. And the question is, has there been any thought to partner with NASA or any other type of government agency to see if there's a way to improve taskable assets by utilizing more novel dataverse or compression algorithms um, back to an ERC or user? Oh, absolutely. And uh, NASA, uh, particularly NASA Ames, has a lovely disaster assistance response team. They, they were at the World Trade Center, and they have a big test facility as well. So all the groups try to work together, and that's, that's something that I'm, I'm really proud of with the IEEE Safety, Security, and Robotics uh, Society has really been pushing on that. So these, these groups do try to work together. Great. Um, and another question that we have uh, is about, you know, what is the typical approach to avoid robot-generated faults or to try and reduce human-related errors? Is this testing, simulation, or uh, some other uh, approaches? Well, I think that the human-robot interaction problem is something that we're, uh, we're just beginning to grapple with and beginning to discover what's different between that, between classic human-machine automation problems that we've seen with factory automation and what we've seen with autopilots. And a big difference between autopilot type, it's very similar to the autopilot problems when an autopilot suddenly kicks out on you. Uh, so we're beginning to learn more about that. We Understanding how to test is hard because it's not, you have to test the technology along with the humans and you have to test in a high fidelity situation. So we've been working on something called concept experimentation, which came out of the Department of Defense, although actually they don't use concept experimentation as much as they probably should, which was a recommendation from the study I was on. But anyway, uh, where you have formal ways of tracking this data to decision process and tracking whether the technology is helping or inadvertently hindering with the mission. So there's a huge amount of work that can be done. And I think that's also another place for computing and analytics. Now that we can wire up everything, how do we gather that data and begin to analyze it? Great. And so here's another question, and this is from Twitter. And uh, so the person is curious about the potential ethical implications of disaster robot data being shared. And so in this case, the question uh, is talking about insurance companies, so we can think about sort of just privacy and data privacy uh, in general. Oh, there are so many issues with privacy. Uh, and we have at A&M, that's another one of the main things I love about being here because we have the Bush School of uh, Policy and going through that. So within the agencies, they can often share information. It's hard for them to do it with some of the uh, social media, not because of, of hacking, but because they have to show uh, HIPAA. And there's another privacy for criminal justice that you have to use. But within agencies, they can do some sharing, and there's that. There are horrible ethical issues with crowdsourcing things like looking for missing or presumed dead people in images. So actually, one of the counties in the, the Blanco floods was on Facebook, had put an enormous amount of time into watching what volunteer UAV teams were and say, no, 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 you've got to take that down. Even though you don't think a person's in there, they could be in there, you've got to take this down. You can only give data to us. And that's a case of where actually we have, they, they have these standards already in place on what you can release and can't release. Manned helicopters, they've been doing that since the 80s. They've worked through provenance, uh, chain of custody and what you can release and what you can't. And so they actually work through that and as long as you're working within their framework, and that's another reason why we work with the agencies, right, is that when we go to a disaster, anything we do is through their chain of command. They actually own the data. We keep it there and we only release later for scientific use what's there. And so they're, when they're doing crowdsourcing, they're looking at crowdsourcing with the other people in the EOC. They're kind of bored and you know, waiting to, you know, they, they, they can't go out on their next ship. So it's, 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 I guess it's crowdsourcing within the tribe that are already approved to look at it. But you're right, ethics, big deal. Great. Um, and then our next question is, would it be a good idea to control a robot by a cooperative style of human-robot interaction, which lets the human control automated small steps of the robot actions? Well, that's really what remote presence is. 
and finding that right balance for different missions and different platforms and, and what you want to delegate to the robot. And it's a physically situated agent, so I think it's actually smarter. We shouldn't be micromanaging it. But you want to, I say it's like, it's like trying to, to ride a horse from 300 miles away. You don't want to say hoof up, hoof down, hoof up, hoof down. You know, you want it to do that while you look and you don't want to fall off the horse or anything right there. So yes, that's exactly the things that, that we're working on and need to work on. And so that, that sometimes is called shared autonomy that gets into this whole set of, of connotations and, and issues in AI. But, but yes, it is looking at humans and machines working together to get the job done. So I'm going to switch to uh, slightly, you know, some of the more technical questions. And so um, one thing that is being asked is what is the sort of accuracy you're seeing for the machine learning problem spotters, um, sort of the, the applications where you have the machine, the computer vision combined with the machine learning to be able to spot um, parts, you know, parts in the images that are of interest. So I think this was in relation to the work uh, you presented in, on slide 49. Yeah, we're... We're looking at, at coming with a better way of coding that error because I'm particularly interested in, uh, in making sure anything that there's any doubt you want to give to the human to look at. You want to triage. You want to basically, the computer takes what's obvious to the computer, which may not be obvious to us, and gets that out. So Marilyn and Berkeley are working on trying to create better metrics of ways of even judging that. And then we get into this whole debate of, of how do you ground truth the image where it's extremely complex, where you might have only a couple of pixels that's a bright color that indicates a Coke can. I mean, you're seeing that level of resolution, by the way, in the images, and how to do that. So that's really forcing us to think about methodology and what's going to be acceptable and, and what's not. And at this point, what we're hearing from the, from the response agencies are like, we don't care. Anything that's going to help us just play the odds because it's all or nothing for us right now. We, we have too much data. We can't possibly go through it, so nobody is really going through it. Or at least this gives us something, so we'll take whatever we can get, which is not great. I think as scientists, we can do better. So great question. And so this is a great lead-in to our next question. Uh, is there a centralized decision-making unit? Um, or, you know, if the robots give the right information to the right persons, or do they, you know, give all the information to the decision-making entity? So how much of it is oh. the, how much is the robot? How much of it is um, processed on the robot? How much of it is sent to the users? Yeah, and and how much is is, is what would they see? Well, so this whole idea of centralized command is so cool because I don't know when I started out, I thought this was like the military and everything was there. Well, okay, then you think about the floods. You had six military organizations; they all have their chain of command, and but they all have to interact with each other. So there's not a straight hierarchy. And there's also uh, what they do, emergency response is divided into about 14 functions, sometimes depends with the different states, but they're called emergency support functions. You can look them up, emergency support functions. ESF-9 is the USAR people, ESF-8 are the medical people, ESF-3 public works. So here we are at the OSO mudslides. We're actually working for ESF-3. They're not worried about, I mean, ESF-9, they're, they're trying to get the survivors out. They are trying to f recover the victims. They're trying to do that safely. They're on one part of the valley. We're on the riverside working with ESF-3, who's like, holy cow, we can't get back there. We can't fly man helicopters saying, you know, to see if that slide's keeping going on, and we can't tell what the river's doing. We know it's damming and ponding and breaking. We're going to have to do some, but we can't see that. So we're actually flying for ESF-3. Well, in the meantime, when we start showing ESF-3 what we're doing, then ESF-9, because they're all back in the same building, the head guys are, looks over and says, holy cow, we could be using that. Why aren't you sending us that information? And they all realize that these ESF have been set up where, where it's not obvious what to share, who owns, who tasks is the primary agency, and then who tells who, who has what information. And so that's a, what a fantastic question and issue in these loosely coupled uh, work groups. How do you know what you don't know? How do you know to ask when you didn't even realize it was out there? And now we're getting more systems like GeoSuite, these tactical ones where the individual responders are reporting where they are. Now you can start inferring what may be assets and what agencies they're working for and then what data they may have that could be distributed to somebody. So that's a whole other area of informatics, totally fascinating. 
So here we have um, Wasim, who's a president of a student chapter of ACM. And so they have a social welfare group uh, in these chapters too. And so if ACM can spread awareness on this issue, um, using that, and also if it can help uh, practically on these disasters via chapters, and how can these students contribute? I think there are so many things. Uh, the Harbor Humanitarian Effort has uh, initiative. They've been working really hard to coordinate with people who are doing open street maps and things. I think right now the one thing that if I could empower student organizations to do is try to help get the word out that these UAVs that people have, the, the hobbyists, they're great UAVs, but like we saw at the California wildfires, and I've seen it a couple of other disasters, are actually interfering with, uh, with the response. Anytime you have a manned helicopter that's doing hoisting operations, trying to you know pick somebody up off a roof or, or drop water on there, they're operating at a very low altitude, which means there is no room for error and a pigeon can take them down well there was a thing in wired you know and they said okay uh, you know pigeon can they uh, uh, a helicopter can do pigeon but remember these are pigeons with batteries so it's exploding pigeon and so we just need to be more careful and if you want to help join your local wilderness search and rescue team with your uavs and get trained and we have best practices and we're working with the un ua aviators on how to do that but uh Try to find ways to work within the system. And again, it, the more that you can do in advance and be prepared so that when that disaster happens, you're not like, oh, how can I help? It's like, okay, here's how I can help. And they know I can help. And they're, we're, we're mutually familiar with each other. That would be the thing I would suggest. So on a similar note, are there any beginner educational tasks for computer science students that could help introduce them to the use of robots in disasters? Well, you know, of course, I'm, you know, way uh, biased, but I do have that book, Disaster Robotics, and I, we have some best practices. I, th I think a lot is just starting to look at that. I think getting engaged in the IEEE Safety, Security, and Rescue Robotics Technical Committee is a is a big way. There's summer schools in Japan and Europe on to engage students and get them bootstrapped on that. And I, you know, I hope this is an area as well that as we see more from the different areas of ACM. So given the fact that we're short on time and uh, a lot of people is actually asking this question, um, so I'm going to sort of, you know, use this as, as the last question. What is your opinion on the DARPA Robotics Challenge? Oh, I think it's, it's great. I think it, as a robotics challenge, it is really pushing technology forward. Now, would you use a humanoid robot? It's not likely to be, a humanoid robot is not likely to be used a lot. And there's a couple of reasons. One reason is, is we don't get a lot of human sized uh, disasters. So that's what's called a process safety disaster, a chemical spill, a nuclear accident. That's one of the few times that a person could physically get in there. So now should a person be in there? Well, and would a person in, in, in there? So that's a, that's a fairly rare case. One of the things that we're looking at here at Texas A&M with our process safety center is looking at the economics of can you, can you just go back in and re-engineer these facilities to co-evolve them with robots so that you have less expensive and less sophisticated robots like something like the PackBots and the uh, Kinetic Talons so that they could open the doors and more easily you know, do, the, uh, do the, the valves and insert sensors. And so I kind of call that the American Disabilities Act for robots. You make a couple of doors different, you do this, what could you re-engineer? And can that make it much more economical to use those type of robots? And then can you use those kind of robots if you re-engineer your process facilities like your chemical and oil and gas plants that way? Can you then start using these robots every day for routine stuff? And so but anyway, I think the DARPA Robotics Challenge, great advances. I am so envious with some of the manipulators. I think that being able to act at a distance, we've mostly seen robots being used to see at a distance. I think it's really pushing the ball forward with that. Great. I'm afraid we have run out of time today, and I would like to thank Robin Murphy again for her informative presentation and insightful answers to the many questions. A special thanks to each of you in the audience for taking the time to attend and participate today. So this thank webinar you everyone. was recorded.
So thank you again, Robin. This webinar was recorded and will be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org slash webinar. You can find announcements on upcoming webinars and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and acm.org. Also, please don't forget to fill out our quick survey uh, at the end of this presentation where you can suggest future topics or speakers, which you should see soon on your screen. This is Ani Shia from Drexel University saying goodbye for now. Thanks again for joining us. Hope you will join us again in the future. Goodbye.